Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 12, titled, Reason to Fear. Good stuff. Ready to study the Bible? That's what we do. All right. Book of Luke, chapter 12, which if you've been with us, you know some, some have been born and died in chapter 11. So you graduated, by the way. There, there, it's, it's graduation month, right? So you have a diploma now to say, I've been through chapter 11 with Pastor Bill. We did start back in October, right? It's been, yeah, it's been two full semesters. So, but just, just so you don't think it's, um, that we're done, chapter 12 is bigger than chapter 11, five verses bigger. So uh, you'll get another diploma at the end, at the end of that. If you'll, if you'll take a look, how many of you have a uh, red letter edition? Like my, my New American has a red letter edition. Some of you have it, some of you don't. If, you'll, if you have a red letter edition, you'll take a look there at the coming pages. They're almost 100% red. So from this point on, basically, we're having Jesus going to be teaching us. And I told you where we are in the progression of time. Jesus has spent the, almost the full three years of his ministry. We're down about two months where you are right now. In fact, we've been in the last four months, basically, of Jesus' life since chapter 9. But from this point on, Jesus is going to be hitting hard on these parables that you know, these stories that you know. And he's, they're going to be all compacted, and not to say that these were only told at this point in his life, uh, but this is the point at which they're recorded in the book of Luke. And so it's going to be significant not to say that any part of the Bible, whether red or black, is one more important than the other. We're certainly not saying that, but you certainly can be sure. You're having the exact words of Jesus here in these red letters. So we're going to be looking here at chapter 12, uh, the first seven verses. But before we get into the details of those verses, we need to back up and take a little bit bigger view of the chapter, of more or less the first uh, half of the chapter, because there's some big the big things happening here. It's going to take us, I mean, how long did it take Pastor Bill to get through chapter, like nine months to get through chapter 11? So I don't know about chapter 12, guys. I really don't. I mean, you, you, I may look like I've planned things out, and that's just, um, that's how I'm fooling you guys. I, I take it one week at a time and I say, what does God have for us now? And I kind of have a general idea of the chapter, how it's laid out. But in general, I don't really know when I get to the beginning of a chapter how long it's going to take. I didn't think it was going to take us uh, seven or eight months to get through chapter 11. So I would say right now it's not going to take us near as long in chapter 12, which means absolutely nothing because I, I really don't know. But I do know this, God's going to take us through here and we're going to be learning and growing and seeing uh, some great things just like we did in chapter 11 of the book of Luke. And we're going to be listening to what Jesus says. We have to go through the verses. Why? Because how can we know that we have what God is actually saying to us if we don't actually study what he says? We just pick topics here and there, go through themes and other things. We're basically just taking excerpts. So how, how about if you wrote me a letter 90 pages long, and then I read it, and I was supposed to read it to this congregation, I only read four sentences. Would you appreciate that? What part did you not write to them? You wrote all of it to them. So it would be my responsibility to read everything that you wrote, whether I like it or not. So the same is true. We have a letter from God here. It's a big one. We need to go line by line in this. Now, we're, every single word, everything unturned, we're not doing in every way that way, but we're trying our best to accomplish that. And so we're going to be looking at uh, these verses in detail and the things that Jesus has to teach us. Chapter 12, Jesus says in one sitting, probably in 30 minutes. It's going to take us three months, I don't know, to go through chapter 12, but we have to get a big picture and constantly coming back to the big picture because he sweeps through this very rapidly. Uh, chapter 12 is significant because it teaches a very important, one of the places it teaches a very important doctrine in Christianity, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. Anybody you ever heard that word before? Trinity? I was pastor of Trinity Baptist Church for eight years before I came to this church years ago. Uh, Trinity. What does Trinity mean? Do you know, or would it surprise you to know, or would it shock you to know the word Trinity is not in the Bible? Did you know that? Maybe you ought to read the Bible. I don't, I don't know. Because people like me can pull stuff over on people like you. It's not in there, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to tell you this is not a word that is from the Scriptures. The word Trinity, as important as it is, as significant as it is, as, as uh, key that it is in our theology, the actual word does not exist in the Bible. It is a word that we invented. And when I say we, I'm not about you or talking about me. I'm not about Christians in general. It's a word that we've used to, to try to describe the the difficult, the complex nature of God. And the, very simply, the complex nature of God is explained in the word Trinity. What is God? He is Trinity. Three persons in 
one. We have this beautiful doctrine presented to us without the word Trinity here in the first part, first close to the first half of the book of Luke, chapter 12. Take a look there in verse uh, 5, first of all. Here we have Jesus speaking of the Father. It says, But I will warn you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has the authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I'll tell you, fear him. So God, this may be a shocker to some of you, can throw you into hell. I hope it isn't. You need to know that. You, don't, you will not understand the blessings and forgiveness and grace of God unless you understand the wrath and righteousness of God. Because of what good is heaven? Of what good is Jesus die on the cross if hell isn't a reality? So he suffered all that because everybody gets to go to heaven anyway? Come on. There has to be a hell. God, the Bible says, will throw you into hell. Part of what makes him God. But then, but what about Jesus? Look down in verse, uh, look down in verse 8. I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will also confess him, will, will, will confess him also before the angels of God, that he who does, denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So God can throw you to hell, but Jesus can keep you out of heaven. So which one of those is God? They both have the same power. But then there's a third thrown into the mix, just to complicate, not just to complicate, because it's just the reality of who God is. So, so skip down to verse 10. And everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, again, that's he's talking about himself, it shall be forgiven him. That's awesome, because a lot of people do. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. So the Father can throw you to hell, Jesus can keep you out of heaven, and so can the Holy Spirit. Which one of those is God? Well, they all are. They all are, and I'm sorry that there's not a better, clearer explanation than that, but so as the kind pastor that I am, and the congregation will tell you that when I get to the place where I can't explain something, I just say, deal with it, there you go, that's the Trinity, deal with it, deal with it, it's who God says he is, the word he doesn't use, but the nature he definitely does use, and it's just a simple way for us to explain who God presents himself as, three persons who are absolutely one, one in nature, co-worship, co-equal, co-glorified, everything completely exact. That's the God of the Bible. Anyone who teaches you a God other than that is not teaching you the God of the Bible. You say, well, that must be, that's more simple. Okay, great. Go with the simple God, but you're going with an unbiblical God. And maybe just say this very carefully, that God does not exist. He is not out there. You're being lied to, and Jesus is going to warn you about the liars today. And we're going to see that in the conversation that he has with us or has with the people there. So let's, before we get into verses 1 through 7, let me just ask you a simple question. So if you had thousands of people gathered around you, kind of like today, like I have, right? Well, you've got these people. We've got, you know, how many, how many angels do we have here? You've got Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know there's three of those. And we've got, you know, you 80 people and then an angel for each one. Some of you had two or three angels for four or five. Some of them are in counseling today, right, Joe? <laughs> we got th hundreds of thousands of, of, of entities here today. No, actually, if, we, if you had thousands of people gathered around you and you had one opportunity to speak to them, what would you speak to them about? Or let me ask you a question because you may not be a speaker. Like, that is what I do. So if I had gathered around me the largest crowd that I was ever going to see in my lifetime, what subject should I pick? The Bible's big. Grace of God, would you suggest? Not a bad one at all. The love of God? Awesome topic. Though, asking that question, I'm asking you this because Jesus is going to have that opportunity here. You're going to see here in chapter 12, Jesus is going to have possibly the largest crowd that ever is to gather around the feet of Jesus. And the topic that he picks is, well, I'd say startling. Maybe not at all what we would pick necessarily. But let's, let's take a look at what it says here. Chapter 12. 12 in verse 1 under these circumstances so under the circumstances he's just told the pharisees and the sadducees that they're a bunch of hypocrites under those circumstances after so many thousands of multitude had gathered together they were stepping on one another it's an interesting word in the greek the word in, that is translated in our translation thousands is the word uh, myriaden it's where we get the word myriad from it literally means countless like, how many were there? I don't know, a bunch. 
Couldn't count them. Now they have a word that is a root word to muriadin, which is the word murion, which, is, which was the Greek word for 10,000. It was the largest number in their vocabulary. Now we have 20,000, 100,000, 1 million, you know, 10 million, 10 trillion. I don't know what's the national debt now. We, have, we, invent, we invent numbers all the time because we have to keep up with you know, our spending kind of thing. The Greeks would only count to 10,000. It's the only, high, biggest word that they had. If it was beyond 10,000, they would use the word muradion, which means myriad. There's a bunch beyond 10,000. So, so what's being said here is that there is a countless number beyond 10,000 who were gathered at the feet of Jesus. That's a bunch. Uh, the, another place where this word is used is in, the, in Revelation chapter 5, where it says there were myriads times myriads of angels. Well, that's more than 10,000 times more than 10,000. So you multiply 10,000 to 10,000, you get 100, 100 million, right? But there was more than that. So how many angels are there? You know, Ken Sabe, nobody knows. Well, there's a bunch. Let's just say that. So, so it's a word for, for redneck. It's a bunch, a way bunch. We couldn't count them. There's just no possible way. And the reason why there is no possible way is because Jesus, as I've told you before, was a rock star. They loved him. He healed everybody. He fed everybody. He walked on the water. He raised the dead. He had impacted the, the, literally the culture of Israel. We're talking about maybe three or four million people, and Jesus healed thousands at a time. So you can imagine there wasn't a person in this crowd who hadn't been somehow touched, either personally or someone they loved, had been, life had been changed by this man. They had been with him when he fed the countless, almost countless numbers, 5,000, they could count that. Uh, but you included also, when you counted 5,000 men, it was just a way to count noses. At least 5,000 women, at least 5,000 children. So it was a way to, so a lot of people with just five loaves and two fish. This guy is a rock star. But, but maybe this isn't a rock current star. It's more like a, a soccer game because they're stepping on each other, right? Uh, they're, they're in, there's no speaker system. He doesn't have a lapel. And so this is the guy who's healing everybody, feeding everybody, walking on the water, uh, raising people from the dead, uh, uh, taking on the Pharisees and Sadducees with a, with a, with a, a dialect and an intellect that they can't, they can't oppose. I mean, he's just, the thing to do is be near Jesus. What are you doing today? What do you mean what we're doing today? We're going to see Jesus. There is not a bigger show in town. That is what is happening. And so they are literally stepping upon each other. Countless thousands of them are doing that. And with this countless thousands, the biggest crowd arguably that Jesus ever saw in his three-year three ministry, with countless thousands, what does Jesus say? Like I said, what should I say if I have countless thousands? What would you say? So what you say and what I say is debatable. So if I said it, was that a good idea, Pastor Bill? Well, I don't know, time will tell. If you said it, well, was that a good idea? Well, I don't know, time will tell. But if Jesus said it, it was the right thing at the right time for the right group of people. So what does Jesus say? Very interesting. All this group gathered around him, and he begins saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Wow. That had been your topic? You'd have been wrong. No offense. You'd have been wrong, because if, if you choose something and Jesus choose something, I'm going to go with Jesus. Right? That's safe. You just, you know, you were off that day. I don't know. You had too much pizza the day before or something. I don't know. You missed the Spirit's move. But Jesus doesn't miss the Spirit. So what did the Spirit have to say to this crowd? Strange, isn't it? Strange to us. And I'm going to submit to you it's not. And we're going to see why. So he says to them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. So from what Jesus says, here's what we can read into this story. Our greatest danger, greatest danger, is false religion that hides behind hypocrisy. That is the largest existential threat on the planet today. If you were with us last week, you saw how does Satan rule the world? Not through immorality. Through religion. False religion is what's controlling the hearts and minds of the vast majority of the people on the planet today. Not debauchery, not immorality, not to say God's in favor of those things, but they're not the issues. The issue is, is that there's teachings out there pervasive to the billions 
I mean, literally, six billion people are underneath some level of false teaching or false, false religion. And most of these false religions, by their teaching, if the people follow them, they are going to hell. That is the biggest existential threat on humanity today. You're going to die somehow. You're not going to live forever. Oh, it's, it's not cancer then. And it's certainly not the coronavirus. It's what's happened to you after whatever gets you moves you out of this world. What happens to you after that is going to matter forever. That, whatever that is, is the biggest and most important things in our lives. Jesus tells us that these guys and what they represent, which is false teaching, is the largest, biggest existential threat on the planet. Hypocrites, it's that he calls them. Actors. We saw that last time. They wear a mask of morality and religion. But inside of them, nothing has changed. They do not know God. They do not teach the truth. They don't represent the truth. They're very, very dangerous. They are soul terrorists. They're plunderers of eternity. The largest existential threat on the planet. Again, if Jesus had a crowd gathered together, what did he say? Not what you would say. That means you're wrong. Jesus is always right. Listen to him. Pay attention. What he says to us is really, you know, we talked about this before. We're, we're sheep and all sheep are what? Dumb. They wake up in a new world every day. They don't know nothing. Not going to know nothing. The only way the sheep know anything is when the shepherd steps in and says, this is how it works. And only the smartest the sheep gets is just to simply say, okay. Well, that's what he said. Well, so when the shepherd speaks, what should we say? Okay. That's what it is. I, you don't have to wait till you feel like it. Oh, I don't really feel like that's the accurate word. Well, stop counting on your feelings. They'll fool you. And, and you're a fool if you follow them. Listen to the shepherd. The shepherd tells us that the thing that we're in danger of is this yeast of hypocrisy that comes from these false teachers, these soul terrorists, these plunderers of eternity. It's interesting, the, the term here, beware of the yeast. You know what yeast is, right? How much yeast does it take to work through a big lump of dough? Ah, just a little bit. Because it's very descriptive. It doesn't take much of these people and their teachings to really mess up a bunch of people. Not much at all. So he's warning us. Very little of this stuff is required to spread through the entire lump. It's not just them then. It's not just, oh, well, there's a Pharisee over there. There's a false teacher. There's a false church. There's a false religion. I'm not going to go near them. No, it's not just where they are and who they are. It's what they teach. It's their doctrines. It's their terminology. It's their attitude about Scripture. It's their attitude about Christ. Again, they do not teach the entire Bible. They don't teach the whole counsel of Scripture. They do not teach a biblical Jesus. They are plunderers of the souls of men. They're manipulating the truth. How do you know you've got the truth when you hear exactly what the Bible has to say? You've got it. you got it. These guys don't do that. These gals, they don't do that. Beware of their writings, of their philosophies, of their influence. Don't be around them. Don't hang around them. Don't hang around their counsel, it says here in Psalm 1. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So do I have to be near a person to hear his counsel? No, he writes books. He preaches on YouTube. He teaches. He writes. His philosophies, theirs, are pervasive in our culture. I've got to be real careful of that. How do I know that? Because that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said. Well, I don't feel like it's such a big a threat. Well, guess what? You're not Jesus. That's what Jesus said. Be careful of their counsel nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, because that's what they're doing. They scoff at God. But this, the, his delight, the person who's blessed, is in the law of God, the Word of God. And on his law, he meditates just two times a day, day and night. That's what's going to deliver you from these guys. How do you know the truth? How do you know the falsehood? You're not going to ever learn it. There's a thousand ways something can be twisted. There's only one way it can be straight. So go with the straight and you'll automatically know what the twist it is any time it comes along. Stick with the straight. Stick with the law of God. Meditate on it only two times a day, day and night. But remember, these guys, they are actors. They're plunderers of the hearts and souls of men. They play the role that they know God, but they do not. They play the role of someone who 
knows the truth and teaches the truth. But they do not. They play the role of someone who is righteous, but they are not. They play the role of those who are going to heaven, but they are not going, and those who follow them also are not going. The largest existential threat on the planet today. Everybody's got to die somehow. But once they step out of this life, where are they going? That's going to last forever. We have to be serious about the things that are truly serious. We have to be. Don't be distracted. So Jesus is going to give us three things here that are, are going to enable us, if we will do them, to avoid the danger of the yeast of these false teachers, not just the Pharisees and Sadducees, but in general, all false teaching. Three different things. We're only going to get to one of them today. But isn't it great, though, in Mother's Day that I'm preaching on hell and fire and brimstone and all that stuff? <laughs> I thought, wow. I, I mean, on behalf of my mom, my mom would, you know, do it, Bill. I raised you right. So here we go. But I'm going to cut it down to only one. So think, things to avoid danger, we're going to talk about next two next week. And, and there's enough to say here to certainly uh, take up the rest of our time. Three things to do to avoid the danger of the yeast, the false teaching and the false leading of these false teachers. The number one thing, the first thing in order as we find them, is that if, to avoid this, you're going to have to fear God. The fear of God will deliver you from most of this. Fear of God. Deeply fear God. I want to show you how deep it is because Jesus gets way into it here. By the way, how do we know the difference between a hypocrite and those who are not hypocrites? Because the hypocrites don't fear God. They don't. That's why they put an outward show on and they care nothing about what's on the inside of them because they don't fear God at all. They don't think they're going to stand before Him. They don't think they're going to answer to Him. They will pick your pockets. They will pick your soul because they have no fear of God whatsoever. Don't be like them. One of the ways you get away from them is by doing what they don't do which is fear God. They don't fear God. They fear men. Jesus tells us here in Matthew 23, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. They just want you to think they're awesome. That's what it goes on to say. They broaden their phylacteries. They, this, these little boxes they would wear with Scripture on their arms and on their foreheads, they would make some great big one so they have to look around it or something just so you could say, oh, a man of God, surely, right? Because he made some box. Broaden their phylacteries, lengthen the tassels of their garments. It's all about you seeing them. They love the place of honor at banquets and the seats of honor in the synagogues and personal greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by the people because that's all that really matters to them and they fear anything other than that. And they will do anything, and I mean anything, to get it from you. They will do anything. So, so, so they, 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 they will continue to do this. They will continue to, uh, to put this forward. They do not fear God. They fear men. And that's the way false religion is. It puts on this huge emphasis on how you dress. They will emphasize that. How, how you dress. How do you know a false teacher? By their dress, by, by, by the emphasis they have on dress, by what you eat, by the emphasis they have on that, by, by the day of the week they want you to worship on. You can only eat these things. Now, I've told you before, and some of you have never been here before, but I, you know, you cannot eat pork, that's okay with me, but, but I eat bacon, and you can just bring it. We have <laughs> refrigerators up here, I'll be happy to take your bacon from you. But if you, if you think, if your heart is convicted not to eat bacon, well, then that's awesome, but I'm not afraid to eat bacon at all. These guys will say, you can't do that, you have to meet on a certain day. Uh, anytime you start hearing that stuff, you know you're dealing with someone who is a false teacher. They are. They're not afraid of how nasty they are on the inside because they do not fear God. They fear you. They fear that you may take away the, the pleasure they have of your accolades. Be careful with these guys. Remember, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, full of corruption, full of death. But you see this beautiful building. Well, that must be a beautiful building. Look how white and gorgeous it is. No, on the inside is a dead person. Ooh. Ooh. That's who he says that they are. So first, it starts with fearing God. Jesus is going to give us three reasons to fear God. Three reasons. Number one, fear God because he will uncover everything that is hidden. Look at with me at verse 2 and verse 3. Jesus is going to uncover everything that has ever been hidden. There is nothing covered up 
You know anybody that covers up anything? Not in this world, right? Not in this world, right? Everybody's honest in this world, right? How many liars we got in this room, by the way? You ever tried it? Some of you, I hope not, I hope this isn't true, but some of you, I'd be willing to bet, are lying about stuff right now. Maybe on your taxes, maybe to your wife or husband. I'm not trying to point, I don't know nobody, I don't know. I mean, all the pastor's talking about me. Well, I didn't know. I'm just saying, you get a room of three people together, and you got 15 lies probably in that room already. We cover up stuff. Nothing, though, that has ever been covered will be anything other than revealed. It says here, nothing hidden will go will, that will not be known. According to whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you whispered in the inner rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. That is a very good reason to fear God. A very good reason, because we all have stuff to hide. There's going to come a day in which it won't be hidden. So there's a very good reason to fear God. A very good reason. Fear God because nothing will go uncovered. Nobody will go, nobody gets away with anything. Take a look at these verses. Here's, here's Paul in two, two different places. God will judge the secrets of, secrets of men. Got secrets? Well, they're coming out. They're, they're coming out. There's coming a day. It's a reason to fear God. By, by Jesus Christ. Therefore, judge nothing, he goes on in 1 Corinthians. Before the appointed time, wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Wow! I have a hard time even knowing my own motives. Have you not finished a day and thought, I don't know why I did that? You ever thought that? Because we don't even have control sometimes of our own motives. But let me tell you something. They're not going to be secret forever. You, you want to know what your motives are? You're going to get a day. You're going to get a day for them all to be heard. Very good reason to fear God. No one's getting away with anything. I was watching a video of a lady who was working at a honey-baked ham store during the holidays, and she was working the evening shift, and uh, she was sitting behind a desk watching monitors because part of the store she couldn't see, and there was cameras back there to make sure people didn't steal things. And a woman comes in. You can see it on the monitor. She comes in through the side door, and she comes down the wheelchair ramp, which is made out of metal. And she comes in and makes a ride and goes to the back of the store. And she goes down a couple of different aisles. And the screens are switching. You know, every time she goes down a different aisle, you can see her walking down that aisle either the back or the front of her. Anyway, she's headed down this one aisle where the, where the big frozen hams are. And sure enough, she pulls a frozen ham out of the freezer and stuffs it up her dress between her legs. And proceeds to leave the store. And the woman is in the video. She's, you know, 911, what do I do? And the woman's headed to the wheelchair ramp and headed out the store. About halfway out of the wheelchair ramp, though, she drops the ham. And it, it hits like a rock on a, on a metal uh, wheelchair ramp. Makes this, and then tumbles down, blam, 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 all the way down to the bottom. And in the video, the woman starts yelling, someone threw a ham at me. Who threw a ham? Call the police. She's, not, you know, it's a big old liar. There's going to come a day in which all the hams are going to hit the floor, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there, that day is coming. Anything you've, anything you've hidden, anything you've hidden, that's coming out. So be ready for that day. Be ready. It's coming. So number one, fear God because nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Number two, fear God because, this is critical, because of what he does to those who do not fear him critical because of what he will do to those who do not fear him that's where it starts it starts with the fear of God notice here's Jesus own words I say to you my friends it's interesting terms but he's not talking about the Pharisees he's talking about are you a friend of Jesus me too so hear him I say to you my friends do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do nothing more. And I, that's hard to do. I don't know about you. Every day, I do things to avoid being killed. Do you? Did you wear your seatbelt? Did you wear your seatbelt? Did, did you drive the speed limit on the right side of the road? Because why? You're trying to avoid being killed. I can't blame you for that. I do the same thing. Do you wear your life jacket when you go fishing? Trying to avoid what? Being killed. It's legitimate. I understand. It makes sense. I mean, who wouldn't want? Who wants to be killed? No one does. Uh, we avoid dangerous situations. We lock our doors. Uh, we don't go certain places. Uh, if you're not from Texas, most of us carry guns. Why? 
trying to avoid being killed. So Jesus says, that's not your biggest problem. Being killed is a terrible thing. I mean, that'd be a bad day, would you agree? But there is something far worse. Notice what he says here in verse 5. Do not be afraid of those who, after killing the body, have nothing more that they can do. Verse 5. But I will warn you whom you should fear. Fear the one whom, after he is killed, has the authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That's a very good reason to fear God. Wisdom starts with the fear of God. It's a very good reason to fear God. And notice something here carefully here. Notice who, who throws you in hell. Who does? Not Satan. And where do we get that? Where in the Bible does it say Satan throws anybody in hell? It's not, by the way, knock yourself out. It's not there. You will not find the word Trinity, and you will not find Satan throwing anyone to hell. In fact, the Bible never encourages us in any way, shape, or form to ever fear Satan. But everywhere it says fear God. I mean, everywhere. Here we have Jesus talking about as plain as you possibly could have a person talk. You need to be fearful of God. God, listen, Satan is not the king of hell. People say that. You know who the king of hell is? God is, just like he's the king of heaven. God is the king of all these things. God is the one that's in control, not Satan. Satan is going to be thrown to that place. And if you're not careful, you can get thrown in that place if we don't fear him because God is, is the one who's capable of doing that. And everyone in the Bible we're told to fear anything other than God. This, is, this is, verse is very, very clear, and the gravity of it all is, is, is powerful. I want you to hear some of the choice words that Jesus uses to explain this place called hell. These are Jesus' own words. Again, not to say that red words are more important than black words in your Bible. But these are all red words in your Bible. Describing hell, Jesus calls it as a place of weeping, a place of wailing, a place of gnashing of teeth, a place of darkness, a place of loneliness, a place of torment, a place of burning. These are Jesus' own words. He says this about hell. He says, if it were possible, and it's not, but if it were, for your eyeball to do something, that would send you to hell, he says, you should take your eyeball and pluck it out. Yeah, that's how better to be maimed and go into heaven, he says, than to go into hell with both eyeballs. That's how serious, again, how serious is this? It's very serious. He's very serious. Some really good reason to fear God because he has the power to send you there. He gives us a third reason. So number one, because God's going to uncover everything that is uh, held secret. Number two, because he has the power to throw you in hell. Number three, because nothing escapes his knowledge. Take a look with me down in verse six. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? That's a question you couldn't answer because we don't buy sparrows anymore, but they they did back then, and that's how much they cost. Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, when you came to South Pottery Island, we got visitors here. How many of you came to see the sparrows? Anybody? Did y'all see all the sparrows outside? What what else is being pulled over on you people? We have thousands of sparrows on the island. What bird did you see when you came here? Or here, here? Oh, the seagulls. The pelicans. Why didn't you pay attention to the sparrows? Because you've got those in your hometown. And they've got them in in Canada, and they've got them in Mexico, and they've got them over in Europe, and they've got them in Asia, and they've got them in Africa, and they've got them in Australia. These sparrows are everywhere. Nobody pays attention to them. That's the point Jesus is trying to make. They're super small. They're brown. No one has a ringtone on their phone of a sparrow singing because they don't sing very pretty. There, there, there's something in the world that there's a lot of that they, we really don't even see because they just simply don't matter to us. The only reason why they mattered in this day is because the poor were able to buy them for two pennies. They ate them. The only reason why they matter to anybody. So, so the point Jesus is making is very simply this, is there a sparrow on the planet that God doesn't know about, even though you know about very little of them? The answer is No. There's not a single sparrow that God does not aware of, that God does not see. God is aware of all these things. And and then he goes on, because that's something that no one notices. Here's something else that no one notices. Look at verse uh, 7. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
By the way, I looked it up. You know the average number of, by the way, some of you are below average. Just, I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> Me too. The average num- number of hairs on a person's head is 150,000. Now, if you want to do the math, times 7.8 billion, and God doesn't lose that count. So, so does it matter to you how many hairs you have on your head? No, no it doesn't to me either. Because why? Because I've got too many other things that matter, right? I don't need to see the sparrows because, you know, there's too many of those. They're too small. I don't need how many hairs I have on my head or how many hairs you have on the head because, you know what, there's, my brain is just not big enough. Here's the point, though. There's nothing that's insignificant to God. And that's bad news if you think you're getting away with stuff. That's really bad news. Because God does not miss a thing. He knows the least things that we know. So why should we fear him? Because he knows everything about you. He knows what you say. He can't forget it. He knows what you think. He can't forget it. He knows what you've done. He can't forget it. And for those reasons, God deserves our fear. But you don't fear him and run away. We're not talking about the boogeyman here. We're talking about the God who created you. We're talking about the God who, because he knows all this stuff and can't forget it, sent his son Jesus to pay for the stuff that you did, that he knew you would do. 2,000 years ago. That is the God we're talking about. The God who wants to, who created you and wants to recreate you in Christ Jesus. Because notice how Jesus, what Jesus says here. So he's been saying, you need to fear him, you need to fear him, you need to fear him three different times. And then in verse 7, notice. And either very hairs of your head are numbered, he says, do not fear. That's interesting. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. And then he says, do not fear. Wow. You are more valuable than many sparrows. See, see. The fear of God is the only thing that can relinquish you of the fear of God. It's the only thing. The devil's going to exist for all eternity afraid of God in hell. Because his fear doesn't drive him to God. The fear of God doesn't, shouldn't drive you away. Like I said, he's not the boogeyman. He, he's, he's paid everything so that you could be his. But it starts with fear. It starts with realizing, no, there really is a God, and I'm going to have to pay for the stuff I've done and thought. And, 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 and said, oh boy, I need to make a deal with him. There you go. He's already made his deal through his son Jesus. That's his deal. Terms of peace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, make my peace with God. No, he's already made his peace with you. His peace is named, it's a person. His name is Jesus. He's God also. And he's the one. You must come to him and confess him and trust him to, to have the salvation that God has for you. Don't fear. If you fear, you have nothing to fear. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much that you have done this for us. Thank you, God. We have to be afraid of a cliff or we won't stop from heading that way. So you have brought fear to us so that we can see how great your grace is to us. God, I thank you that you take our fears away. We can know that our sins were nailed to the cross. We can know that because Jesus has risen from the dead that the penalty of death and the hell that was headed for us has now been taken away. God, I thank you that we can know these things. They're absolutes. So we trust you, God. We trust you with our hearts, with our minds, uh, with our souls. We thank you, God, for delivering us from uh, the dangers, the real dangers of the world, which is false teaching. People that, and religions that teach something that's not true about you are not about you at all. Thank you, God, for this time that we've had together I pray that you bless these teaching and words in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.